Welcome to the LDN Radio Show, brought to you by the LDN Research Trust. I'm your host, Linda Elsigood. I have an exciting lineup of guest speakers who are LDN experts in their field. We will be discussing low dose naltrexone and its many uses in autoimmune diseases, cancers, etc. You're invited to join us on air asking your questions by calling in on the local rate phone numbers in the UK and the US, which can be found on ldnradio.org. Thank you for joining us. Today our guest is Dr. Sarah Zeldoff from Illinois in the US. This show is sponsored by Mark Drugs, who specialise in the custom compounding of medications, assuring that the client gets the proper prescriptions for their unique needs and conditions. They work with practitioners, integrating knowledge and treatment of experts to create comprehensive health plans. Visit markdrugs.com or call Roselle 630 529 3400 or Deerfield 847 419 9898. I'd like to welcome Dr. Sarah Zeldoff to the show and we're honoured to have her here with us today. I interviewed her a few months ago and the response was absolutely amazing. Not only does she prescribe LDN, but she takes it herself for Hashimoto's. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Well, for those people that haven't heard of you yet, would you just like to recap and tell us about yourself? Sure. Um, I have my undergraduate in microbiology. Uh, I have a master's degree in uh, emerging infectious disease, um, public health and microbiology. I took my Medical de- my medical degree from Loyola in Chicago. I pursued and completed a residency in internal medicine from Loyola and um, the Heinz VA, also um, in Chicago. And um, I have been practicing functional medicine for um, the last year and a half uh, professionally. And I have a great interest in integrative and functional medicine, having um, had my journey with autoimmune disease myself. Okay. And everybody absolutely loved hearing your story. If you wouldn't mind telling us it again, that would be great. No problem. <laughs> Trying to give you the, uh, the, the little tiny version. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I, I uh, grew up having um, some medical issues. I actually was born premature Prematurely, I had um, a tracheoesophageal fistula when I was born, and I was born six weeks early, so I had to have surgery to um, reroute my my feeding tube and my windpipe and my stomach, and I had to have a feeding tube from that. I was pretty sick, and so I I, I didn't have the normalist of beginnings, but um, I, I got well, I, I fed well, and and, and grew up, we think we thought that things were, you know, okay. Because of that surgery, I had scoliosis um, um, diagnosed when I was, before I um, hit puberty, and that caused back pain, and, um, you know, kind of go on from there. And then when I hit college, I, I began to uh, feel fatigue after I had a really profound event happen. I was doing a, an away rotation in Pittsburgh, and I was living by myself, and I got this crazy virus that hit my ear actually and caused this vertigo. And I think now that it actually was Epstein-Barr virus. I was very, very sick. And after that, when I came back to college for my, um, for my third year of college, I wasn't the same. I was sleeping you know, all day, sleeping before class, during class, after class, all night, never getting a restful night of sleep, putting on weight, having dry skin, hair falling out, the whole nine yards, and was finally diagnosed um, um, by by um, endocrinologist with hypothyroidism, and that was the end. I was put on low-dose Synthroid um, or levothyroxine and sent on my way. And 
for the next 10 years as I pursued my various degrees, um, I'd have honeymoon periods of doing well. And then I'd get very, very sick, as I, as I know now that that's an autoimmune flare. Um, I actually have hypothyroidism in my family, um, an autoimmune disease in the family, but, but it wasn't really put together. Nobody ever told me that diet could make a difference. Nobody ever told me that there were adjunctive medications or treatments or even holistic things that could make things better. Um, so I suffered really greatly. I actually took a medical leave in my first year of medical school because things were so, um, things were so hard. And um, I, I gained almost 50 pounds in medical school. Um, I had been on low doses of T3 prescribed by one endocrinologist at various points, which as I know now, those correlated with me doing better um, than when I was on only T4 monotherapy. Um, but I still had not made the connection with diet. And so um, I gained a lot of weight and I was actually diagnosed with a fatty liver um, during my first year of residency. It caused a lot of pain. It was actually the size of my entire abdomen. I had to have a liver biopsy and was diagnosed with uh, first stage NASH, which is non-alcoholic hepatitis, which is actually fatty liver that gets inflamed, which could proceed to cirrhosis. And at that time, they told me that I had a 50-50% chance of progressing to kill me. And they didn't, they didn't say that it had anything to do with my thyroid. And at that time, that put me into a tailspin, and I basically dropped everything and did all the research. And, and, and I got so sick that I was bedbound at one point. Um, and so I had my second leave. I had a leave from residency at that time, a medical leave. And at that time, that's when I found functional medicine, and I read everything that I could about biochemistry and figured out that, you know, there really is a connection between hypothyroidism and fatty liver and hypothyroidism and X, Y, and Z and realized that it had to do with everything. And I finally got tested and found that my antibodies were very, very high. I had antibodies in the tens of thousands at one point. Um, and I was, I, I changed medications and slowly started to get better. And um, I went back to work. Um, having changed my diet, I followed a, um, a autoimmune protocol diet that I, that I talk a lot about with my patients. And I really had to change everything. I did intensive therapy to work on a lot of issues from my past. And I, I literally had to change everything in my life. It wasn't just thyroid medicine. With autoimmune disease, one has to do a lot, a lot to combat, to combat what's going on with the immune system. It really is changing your lifestyle and, and really focusing your, you know, changing your paradigm, actually. So that really changed the way that I practiced medicine. And it became clear that I couldn't I could, when I came back going to residency and, and working in the standard medical model, model was very difficult. Nobody was open to me talking about how, why is it that I look better and feel better and, and seem very different, you know. They didn't want to hear why, the real reasons why. Um, I, I was very, very, very lucky in that in the year that I had the liver issue, I also lost my periods. I was very sick. I it turns out had severe adrenal dysfunction. My cortisol was extremely high. I had no period. I was actually hospitalized. They, they thought I had Cushing. They wanted to do exploratory brain surgery on me at a major medical center. Um, I mean, it, it, was, it was really intense, the time. And I, I didn't have my period for almost nine months. And so I, I went to a, to a specialist, and she said I might not be able to ever have children, which was a really difficult blow because I, I had been married at that time for – almost eight years, and thought that maybe at the end of my medical training, maybe I'd have a baby, and that was just kind of taken off the table from me. And so I went back to work and kind of, you know, was getting back to things, um, and I had signs that I was getting better, and I did. I, I got pregnant, and I had a, had a baby while working through residency. I was working 80 hours per week. It was not, not mm -hmm. for the faint of heart, but I had a healthy baby girl. I was very, very grateful, and she's really the biggest um, – the biggest validity that I have of the fact that you can heal from autoimmunity because, the, you know, I was dying. I, I was dying two years before I had her. And then in, two, you know, 2012, uh, New Year's, you know, New Year's of 2013, I was on medical leave. And August of 2014, I had her. So it was a very quick turnaround. Um, but then I flared. I flared postpartum, which is very, very common with stress and and having a new baby and your immune system changes postpartum, and, and that's very common. And I, I saw a doctor who prescribed low-dose naltrexone, and I worked up to 4.5 milligrams. I did um, the original Bihari protocol, and um, I, in about a month, got my life back. 
I, I really just made a huge turnaround. I was following a modified um, approach to my diet as well, but I really credit the LDN for salvaging my ability to work and, and really keeping me well. And um, I was on LDN continuously for about a year. I um, felt really good and took a break from it for a while and then decided with private practice and with everything going on that you know I, I really did better with LDN. So I, I restarted it and I currently do take low-dose naltrexone. And I'm a huge proponent of it. I, um, I've, I have a very large practice with over, I've seen over well over 1,000 patients in a year, probably 90%, 90 plus percent I treat for autoimmune disease, and I offer low-dose naltrexone to anyone that'll hear about it. That is just such an amazing story, and I could never tire of hearing it. Um, you know, you have done amazingly, and to be able to use your own experience to help your patients, even though it wasn't very good for you to go through, you certainly can add the personal touch as well, and understanding, which I think must put you head and shoulders above other other doctors. Thank you. We have um, one question just come in from Asia, and she said, "Could you describe the autoimmune diet that you discuss with your patients?" Yes. So, so there are a variety. There's not one autoimmune approach, but in general, we want it to be a very anti-inflammatory diet. And, and there are different flavors of this. So you can't take this as, as gospel, you know. Every person will have to have a, um, a personalized approach. So, but in general, every patient that has autoimmunity really should be off gluten. Gluten is uh, an inflammatory protein that is in wheat. And... Um, and I truly believe in this. Now, there are some ancient forms of wheat that are easier to digest, but the fact is the new grains that we have in our, on our planet, our immune system has never seen, and we're reacting to that. And certain populations, so I'm, I'm European descent, certain populations have really poor ability to digest grains. And so I, uh, the strict autoimmune protocol actually eliminates all grains because there are a lot of cross-contamination um, with other grains than wheat. The other major, major, um, major potential inflammatory um, foods include dairy. Um, so it's grains and dairy, and then um, sometimes we add nightshades. So that's tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, peppers. Um, and then we go down the list. Some people are sensitive to eggs. Some people are sensitive to nuts and legumes. Some people are sensitive to certain seeds, and also sugar. I really, I say no, no artificial sweeteners, um, and and uh, no, um, no refined sugars. So we say no white foods, and then we want to really balance our fats and proteins and carbohydrates, and really have fat and protein rich foods to be up front. So in general, an anti-inflammatory diet may look like one that's um, rich in good fats, so olive oil, coconut oil, avocado. However, some people may be sensitive to certain foods. I have to add that as a asterisk. And then um, meats, wild-caught fish, and I have to say grass-fed um, beef has higher levels of omega-3s and conjugated linoleic acid. And then really eating the colors of the rainbow, rainbow what we call the phytonutrient spectrum. Um, every vegetable and fruit actually vibrates at its own um, at its own resonance, its, its own wavelength on the, um, on the ultraviolet spectrum, which is so amazing because that actually resonates with how we process these foods at the cellular level. So we want to eat the, the most variety on a plate. So I say if you eat the most colorful plate that you can, that's doing your body the best, the best that you can. So fruits and vegetables should be the mainstay, should be the bottom of your pyramid instead of the grains. And then wild-caught fish and seafood and meat, um, and pastured chicken and good fats should be really the basis um, for the rest of the diet. Well, that's really good advice there. And I think with you saying, you know, everybody's individual and some people could be more sensitive to some foods than others. How would you go about finding out what foods you're sensitive to? 
So it depends on the patient. We now have um, some testing, some very advanced testing that can be done, but in the U.S. it's not covered by insurance. And it definitely wouldn't be accepted by the NHS. I know that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, if a patient has the money to spend, um, I'll often run some of these advanced testing um, to give us basically a, a personalized approach to what we call the AIP or, a, or a, an autoimmune paleo template. If someone has cardiovascular disease, I'm going to do a more Mediterranean approach, for instance. Um, again, I'm going to work with that person at a very personalized level. Um, if they don't have the means to be able to test, I often start with a very strict elimination diet, and I may not go as strict as, you know, the full autoimmune protocol, but if a patient, you know, and if a patient has their symptoms really resolved, you know, if they're having bowel issues and it gets much better just by eliminating gluten and, and dairy, then great, you know, we've, we've really hit on that. But if they're still having symptoms, then we really need to go deeper. Um, and then I'll be looking at other things, too. You know, there's the issue of, of different, um, you know, uh, different sugars and, um, and uh, specifics, specific products of foods that can cause problems like histamines or oxalates or salicylates. So it, it can get pretty, pretty nitty-gritty. Mm. In bought foods, canned foods... Um, sources, things that are pre-prepared in supermarkets, if you look at them, most of them have sugar. Um, yes. I was, <laughs> I've been reading labels and things like soups, you know, even though they're marketed yeah. as healthy soups, they've actually got quite a bit of sugar. Uh, and of course, yeah. and, and, and unfortunately, unfortunately, it's the, ke- the chemicals too. When they say this is low fat, mm-hmm. if it's low fat or low sodium, you have to think that it's filled with other chemicals. Yes. I think the the best way is to go back to basics and buy the raw ingredients and cook it yourself. The least you know what's in it. Yes, absolutely, and that's what I advocate for. You know, the the our gen um, the the newest generation, the children of um, the you know the young people now, they don't know how to cook because mm-hmm. their parents don't cook, mm-hmm. and so that's that's a huge mm-hmm. issue. There are people out there like um, Michael Pollan, for instance. There's a great series called Cooked, um, but but where they look at cultures and they look at the importance of the home and how, you know, this cultural memory is passed down with food and with cooking, and we're losing that in our modern day. Mm. Really interested. We could, we could talk about this for, for a long time. We'll just have a break, and we'll be back in just a minute. The LDN Research Trust has its own forum, which can be found forum dot ldn research trust dot org or via our website the forum is divided into sections so it's easy to navigate and find what you're looking for you can share your experience ask questions keep a journal etc unlike facebook the posts are always easy to find and don't get buried we have a private medical professionals only section to find out more please email me linda at ldnrt.org. This show is sponsored by Mark Drugs, who specialise in the custom compounding of medications, assuring that the client gets the proper prescriptions for their unique needs and conditions. They work with practitioners, integrating knowledge and treatment of experts to create comprehensive health plans. Visit markdrugs.com or call Roselle 630-529-3400 or Deerfield 847-419-9898. Welcome back. Uh, We have a question from Barbara. It's a very long question, so I'm going to shorten it. She says she was on the Synthroid Synthyroid um, at 0.175 for years for hyperthyroidism. And she was doing very well on LDN for fibromyalgia and Sjogren's syndrome for a year and she wasn't getting sick. And then she was um, ill with a stomach virus. She then had um, blood tests done and she got a copy of the lab report and a TSH dropped to 0.04 
and her FTP4 dropped from 2.29 to 1.6. She wants to know if the changes could be due to the LDN. Uh, yes, it can. It can. I, I would need the full, the full laboratory report to see and also to know if she's having hyperthyroid symptoms. So, so if her TSH is suppressed, but she's feeling okay, and her, I would, I would have her get a, you know, a T3. Unfortunately, I, I don't know if she's in, in, in the UK, but I know that the, that they've removed T3 from the formulary and they're actually, NHS doctors are no longer even allowed to to actually test T3, she, which to she's me is in incredible. The U, she's in the U.S., by the way. She oh, perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, she needs a T3 drawn to see because if the T3 is normal and she feels okay, then she may not necessarily be hyperthyroid. Um, however, that is a very, very low TSH for someone who is only on Synthroid. So she's either on now too high of a dose because of the LDN, that the LDN is stimulating the thyroid more. Mm -hmm. um, and that could happen from illness. Um, uh, but I'd have to look at everything. And yes. she, she needs a skilled practitioner to, to discern that because, uh, you know, the someone who's not familiar with LDN won't know what to do. Mm. She says she stopped the um, Synthroid for a couple of weeks oh. and then she restarted at uh, 0 0.15. Um, and she's got some okay. more lab tests coming but she says she's struggling with an inner ear issue, which was left from a sinus infection. And she now has the worst yeah. fatigue she's suffered in two years or more. So, oh, um, yeah, poor Barbara. So she's definitely got mm, issues. Yeah. So your advice would be for her to discuss it with a, an LDN prescriber. Or, you know, at least at least someone who a functional medicine doctor who's Who's really who really understands thyroid, and and who can tease out what's going on because she likely still she may have a post viral syndrome. I mean she's not completely cleared up with her ear. This, you know this this could last. And you know there 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 are other modalities, other doctors that can help with that. You know vestibular um, rehabilitation can help too. For instance, get get things on track if she's still having ear symptoms. I've sent some of my patients for that. And you know, other other there are other alternative approaches too. Mm, thank you. Well, I hope that answers your question, Barbara. Uh, if not, you will have to get back to us. We have a, a question from Kimberly from the, our Facebook group, and she wanted to know um, for people taking LDN with Hashimoto's, have you seen a lowering yes. of TPO antibodies? And if so. Absolutely. Did they continue taking yeah. LDN? So that's that's an open-ended question. I have, you know, I can use my own my own example. Mm -hmm. uh, I my antibodies were ten in the ten thousands, and during pregnancy they dropped to between fifty and one one hundred ish, which is common. Postpartum they were they were probably in the three to four hundreds, and with LDN they consistently dropped to under 100 and I've had that I've had that very significant uh, effect happen with many patients we've we've really seen antibodies drop um, and it's not usually just with LDN it's a combination of LDN and diet and selenium and other cofactors for thyroid and other things that that have proven to to help antibodies but I, I really I really am, am excited with with what we've seen with LDN it's helped a lot okay she says um, she's been on LDN for three months now and her TPO is still over 900. Would you say that three yeah. months isn't long enough for those antibodies to come down? Um, I, I agree. I usually give the first... Is she, I mean, it depends. Is she on four and a half milligrams? Yes, she is. I, yes. I think that it, just, it, can take, it can take six months or more to get full effect. But if that's not causing it, if it's not helping it to be dropped, then we have to go at, as far as looking at other places. It could be a co-infection that's driving her antibodies. It could be a food sensitivity. It could be all of the above. Mm -hmm. So if, if antibodies are not dropping, then there's something else that's stimulating the immune system and the LDN is not able to counter that. Yes. Um, some people think that LDN is like a, a magic pill 
that if you take it, you don't it's have not. to take anything else, no. <laughs> and that you can continue eating what you like, you know, and uh, that's not how it works, is it? No, no. I, You know, coming from someone with autoimmune disease, I, I, I really wish that were the case. You know, you take the pill and, and you're... You're slim, trim, happy, and, you know, and, and without autoimmune disease. But that's just, it's just not how it works. And also, you have to take into account how long one has been sick. Mm. You know, I have patients coming to see me who, who have been sick for decades, and they're expecting, you know, that they take LDN and that they feel better. And, you know, three months in, they're very disappointed that, you know, they don't. But, but I always say that we have to keep searching, that LDN is wonderful. And for some people, you know, I've had people have their, you know, go from over 1,000 on their antibodies to, you know, 500 in, in a month or two. And that's with eating, you know, primarily a gluten-free diet. But, but they, they do wonderfully. And then I have others that it remains stubborn, over 900, and they're frustrated. And it means there are clearly other things that are driving, driving that antibody production. And... An autoimmune condition, you really have to work at it, don't you? It, it has to become a way of life. Um, Absolutely. Every, every, every day. Mm -hmm. And as, as you know, as you know, you know, you, you just can never take it for granted. You know, one day you feel great. And, you know, I'm a doctor. I know all of this. And, and there's no telling, no saying that, you know, I won't flare again. It's mm -hmm. just, it, it's just working at it every day and doing your best. Yes. Well, thank you. I hope that uh, helps you, Kimberly. We have a, another message here from Susan, and she said she's recently heard about T1 and T2 dominance in our immune systems. Um, somebody had mentioned that LDM promotes T2 dominance. Is that true? What is your opinion about T1 and T2 and how we can manage the balance? So, number one, it's not as simple as that. I'm just going to asterisk that because I don't want somebody to say, oh, this is this, so I do that. I wish it were that case because my job would be so much easier. <laughs> um, Dr. Dutchies Kar <laughs> Karazian is the kind of the godfather of um, functional autoimmunity and his, his um, belief in the Th1 versus Th2 dominant pathways. And he actually wrote in his first book about challenging that, and we now know that that is a potentially dangerous thing to do. So we don't necessarily want to say this disease is Th1 dominant, so we give this to balance it out. It, it's, more, um, it's, it's more nuanced than that because the immune system is so complicated. Um, and so there are, there are some conditions that we can say are Th1 dominant, and now we're talking about the cellular immune system, okay? And these are two branches of the immune system. One side that helps to fight and promote inflammation and one side that helps to cool things off. And so Th1 includes many diseases and Hashimoto's is primarily a Th1 dominant disease. And so the theory is when you have a Th1 dominant disease that you want to give things and promote things that are Th2 dominant to promote that. And yes, LDN is because it helps promote um, promote um, cooling of inflammation through the increase of T regulatory cells and um, through the um, IL-17 pathway. So it's just, it's, it's very complex. It's not as simple as that, but yes, it does. And so with TH2, for instance, one of my favorite things to give, I give resveratrol. Um, that's uh, to help with TH2 pathway um, to help cool off inflammation. But here's something. If I, we learn this, that if you have a person who's in a flare because they've got a virus or they've got some condition that they're fighting right at the same time that they have this autoimmune disease and you want to give them a whole bunch of Th2 stuff, then you might not allow the body to actually fight that virus or disease off, and they may end up worse than if they let that happen and that you actually accentuate the Th1 side and, and let the body fight that off and then send in the T regulatory pathway and the, the TH2 side to cool it off. So it's, it's very challenging. It's very challenging. Wow. <laughs> it, it sounds it. So there we are, Susan, there's your answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really understand the question <laughs> personally. I don't know that much about uh, thyroid. We have a question from Naz who has Hashimoto's and she says that, 
she's read conflicting information that LDN can, LDN causing cyclokines, cytokines, and NK yeah, cells mm -hmm, to increase. Um, is this in the short term or long term? Could you tell me what, where, when, and how, and everything in between? Oh, so hard, hard to tell. There have been mixed reports because there aren't that many studies at the cellular level of low-dose naltrexone. Now, a lot of this is, is studying cancer. You know, we're doing a lot. They're doing a lot of in vitro studies on, um, on animal cells and things like that with LDN because they're looking at this as a powerful adjunct for being an anti-cancer medication um, at the university level. And we want natural killer cells. We want robust natural killer cells to be able to help fight off virus and parasite and, and all sorts of bugs. Um, and so we want that, but we want them to be checked. We want them to be, um, we want them to be under control instead of out of control, attacking things that they shouldn't attack. So <clears throat> all of us, we all, all the time are sending off these signals called cytokines. And some of them are pro-inflammatory and some are anti-inflammatory. And so yes, LDN helps stimulate a cytokine pathway, but in my opinion, that is an anti-inflammatory pathway and not a pro-inflammatory pathway. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just having a look here. We've got a question from Kay and she also has Hashimoto's. She says this is a belt and braces question because she wants to give LDN the best chance to make a, dish, a difference to her condition. She says she has back pains and on occasion has to see an osteopath when she has a flare. She understands that mm -hmm. uh, she can't take opiate painkillers, but she presumes that ibuprofen is acceptable. She takes them a great deal when she has to stand or walk a lot. Um, are there any other pain medications that she can take? Well, I have to preface this by I'd have to know her specific case and she should check with her provider because some things can interact with other things. Um, large doses of ibuprofen are not the best because they can tear up the gut lining and that's a significant concern of mine. Um, you know, if, if you're flaring and you absolutely need non-steroidals, that's, 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 you may need them. Um, there are people, there are compounding ph pharmacies that can do topical varieties of those non-steroidals that don't get absorbed by the gut, um, which are much easier. And, and so I'd recommend talking to someone like Mark, Dr. Mandel, um, um, and I'm sure uh, we've got a list of other compounding pharmacists that, that can help. But they, they really can prescribe a lot of really cutting edge things that can help with pain and really target the type of pain that it is. I also use other things than, than non-steroidals. I'll use lidocaine patches in conjunction with, with LDN for my patients. It's really worked quite, quite wonderfully. I've used larger doses of curcumin, um, which is um, the active component in turmeric with some, um, with, when it's activated. And you really need higher doses. In fact, um, liposomal form is preferred. Um, and then other other things. I like other topical um, topicals for minor pain, aches and pains. You know, like arnica, uh, calendula, different things like that that are that are real natural and, and um, mild. But if it's truly terrible pain and you're in a flare, number one, you have to really work on the inflammation from the inside, and that's diet. And I would never say to someone, you know, that absolutely needs that ibuprofen, you know, that they can't have that. It's just best to find other adjuncts so they can use less of it. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. And she also says that she doesn't drink much and she wondered if it was all right to have alcohol in moderation and she would appreciate <laughs> your views. So it's interesting. There are certain gray areas, alcohol and tramadol being two of them that I get asked about a lot. And I have patients that can tolerate a drink. They can, you know, they can they can tolerate a drink or two and be fine on it. And I, I literally had a patient last week have a reaction to one mojito, and she was very angry about it. And I said, <laughs> well, I don't advocate I don't advocate drinking on it because because this can happen. You can feel very sick. Um, so unfortunately, the only way to find out if you can for that individual person is to have a drink. And I would suggest taking a very very small 
small amount of alcohol to test it. Um, you know, there's only one way to find out, but in general, I advocate for not drinking on it. Mm -hmm. Have you experimented, Sarah? Well, I have, I have a, a liver that's not too happy, so I don't drink. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I, <laughs> I, I'm not a drinker, but if I go somewhere and I'm socializing, I can have a small glass of wine, but I feel that's enough. I just do not want any more, and yeah. I just drink water. Um, but really, I can go without it. But I can drink a glass of wine and, and feel absolutely fine, but I really feel that that one is, is more than enough. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a question here from Nikki. Uh, she knows that you treat patients other than with thyroid issues. She's got multiple sclerosis. She's had it for six years. Um, yes. um, rather, she's been taking the LDM for six years. She's been told that she's got to have a full abdominal hysterectomy, and she's very concerned about taking LDN. Um, she doesn't want to stop because she's been feeling better than she's ever felt, and it could take yeah. weeks for her to heal. So her question is, she's really stressed. She's very worried. And she's then concerned that she will have a relapse stopping taking the LDN. How soon should she stop the LDN and how soon would she be able to take it? And what can she do in that in-between time to try and halt having a relapse? Yeah. Well, a couple things. If she's, if she's not, you know, if she doesn't have to have the surgery right away and she's got several weeks, she can work on increasing her vitamin D level because vitamin D is really important in autoimmune disease and especially in multiple sclerosis. There have been very strong studies to show that, that, that having an adequate vitamin D level, we're talking 50 to 80 um, at that level, is, is really, really um, good for preventing relapse. Uh, once a person's in remission along with diet. I would suggest reading the work of Dr. Terry Walls. She's, uh, she's an internist out of Iowa in the U.S., and she has over a million-dollar grant from the NIH for a Walls protocol, which is more of a, it's a, a very intense uh, paleo approach that can really help patients with autoimmune disease. And she, she did it because, she, she derived it because she has relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. So I would really work on diet. And then... Um, if she needs to have the hysterectomy, she would need to be off her supplements probably two weeks before and her low-dose naltrexone at least a week before. And then she cannot be on her low-dose naltrexone again until she's off any opiate medication, any pain medication. So, um, you know, God willing, they could get her, you know, on a, a regimen of non-opioid medication within the first, you know, I don't, I don't know how long, um, but, but get her on other agents so that she can restart the LDN and then work with someone that can really work with her nutrition and her vitamin D levels and all of the other, you know, all, all of the other possible anti-inflammatory um, modalities that can really help. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of anybody saying before stopping supplements before having um, an operation. What, why is that, Sarah? Certain ones, like vitamin D can act as a blood thinner. Okay. So, um, so certain surgeons have now been saying, because so many patients now are not talking about their supplements, they're just taking a lot of supplements. So a lot of surgeons, especially in the U.S., will say no supplements. Those, those that I have, I have worked with. So I, I, always, I always say, please talk to your surgeon about what they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I must admit, the last few times I've had operations nobody has asked me if I took any supplements let alone which supplements so mm -hmm. that is something for people to bear in mind if you're having an operation make sure that you tell the anaesthetist exactly what supplements you're taking and that is really good that you need to actually stop vitamin d um how long did you say Sarah before you have anaesthetic you usually usually we say usually we say two weeks two weeks okay and just it's a question that we get asked a lot um, with having dental treatment, having a local yeah. anesthetic. What is there anything you should do in preparation for that? Um, you know, uh, 
I'm not sure of the question. So, so just just um, making sure that you have no allergies, you know, no known allergies to that specific treatment. Um, if you've had issues with nausea or problems, that you alert the people that are that are going to be doing that that um, treatment. Um, and then for LDN, obviously looking to see if they're going to be giving an opioid-based uh, medication. That's a concern, so that so that you may need to stop your medication before before having um, anesthesia. Mm -hmm. I was meaning dental treatment, where they give you local anesthetic in your gum. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, usually I just recommend talking with talking with the person that's going to be doing it, so they have great sensitivity to your medical condition. Because patients with autoimmunity can have issues with tolerating those things and mm -hmm. may need a lower dose mm -hmm. versus a higher dose. And you know, really having someone that will listen to you because our needs are different than those of the other popu those of the regular population. Mm -hmm. that, that's interesting. Thank you. So we'll just take one more break and we'll be back in just a moment. The LDN Research Trust's Facebook group has almost 18,000 members around the world. It is a great place to start your research and connect with others. www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash LDNRT. It is a closed group and only members can see your post. Nothing is shown on your page or feeds. Posts can't be shared. We do also have a page where you can share links. It's www.facebook.com forward slash LDNRT. Check out our books, conference pages by searching on Facebook. The LDN Research Trust also has a Twitter account and you can find us on twitter.com forward slash LDNR Trust. This show is sponsored by Mark Drugs, who specialise in the custom compounding of medications, assuring that the client gets the proper prescriptions for their unique needs and conditions. They work with practitioners, integrating knowledge and treatment of experts to create comprehensive health plans. Visit markdrugs.com or call Roselle 630-529-3400 or Deerfield 847-419-9898. Welcome back. We have a question for May, and she says, have you ever prescribed LDN for a child? We have, yes. Okay. Her question then is, have you treated a child with cerebral palsy with LDN? No, we have not. I, I haven't been given the opportunity, quite honestly. I'd have to look at every every bit of that child's that child's case, and, and, and you know, it, it may not be the cerebral palsy that I'm treating, but it may be, you know, a feeding issue or like gastroparesis or another underlying condition that's very, very common with CP. Okay. So maybe May should try and find a, an LDN prescriber and seek their advice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. We, we have another interesting one here. Um, from Christina and she's got Sjogren's syndrome and she says that she's just started yeah. LDN and she's had pericarditis for several months. Have you heard of any success yes. with LDN for that? Yes, yes, actually. I, I have a, like a 13, 12, maybe a 12 year old child uh, who had, um, actually she had she had actually HSP. She had Hanuk Schonlein purpura, that, that is this autoimmune condition, an autoimmune vasculitis that causes a rash, and it actually went to her heart. She had a terrible pericarditis, and it, it had recurred with all of these different drugs. It had recur recurred with steroids, and she gained all this weight, and she's been on the, the standard of care with an NSAID and with the, with the steroid, and nothing had helped. And She's done beautifully with low-dose naltrexone. She's had, 
she's had a very minor flare, but she's done remarkably well with with the LDN. Yes. Wow, that, that's amazing. I can remember my mother had um, pericarditis and they thought she was having a heart attack. She was uh, Absolutely. Quite, quite bad with it. Mm, she was hospitalised for, for a few weeks. OK, uh, we've got so many questions here. Um, we've got one from Joanna and her question is, She's, she says, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I am in such a bad way and I'm not sure where else to turn to. I've heard many wonderful things about LDN and thought it was at least worth giving it a go as a last resort. She has severe ME, CFS, and also has really bad adrenal fatigue. Um, she said it happened after a doctor gave her too high a dose of steroids, which shut down her adrenal flant. Green, adrenal glands she's read um, oh, no. that those with adrenal fatigue can't take LDN and it makes their renal fatigue worse is that correct no I don't believe so I believe that if you're not treating the underlying cause and you're just trying to do LDN that yes you can get worse because you're working on something completely different because um, we've been, I've been reading that actually the, um, the epidermal growth factor that's actually stimulated by LDN is produced by the adrenal glands in large amounts. And if the adrenals don't work and they can't produce them, then it's not going to work. And you're not going to feel better, and for some people they may feel worse. And so really I like to use LDN on my adrenal patients when they have their adrenals being stimulated. And, you know, she may need small amounts. She has to be treated as an Adazonian patient. This is not just adrenal fatigue. If her, if her adrenals actually do not stimulate and she does not um, have significant, you know, function, she needs proper treatment, you know. So it, it's, it's much greater than, greater than LDM. There's mm -hmm. a lot that has to be done. Yeah. She says that she's bedridden and she finds it very difficult oh. to actually get out to seek help I'm sure um, mm. there there are people that do phone consults i i do phone consults if needed and you know is she on is she on a therapeutic dose of hydrocortisone for someone that actually has adrenal um adrenal insufficiency you know has she had a stem test um has she had a morning cortisol you know these are all questions that i'd want to know okay so uh, if anybody would like a phone consultation with you, do they have to be in Illinois or can they be anywhere? No, they can be anywhere. I can't accept insurance, though, for phone consults, so mm -hmm. they would need to call for rates, and I just charge for my time. Okay. Um, fine. If people... What kind of a doctor would you say is the best place to start to look for an LDM prescriber that can actually so, treat with more holistic approach? Yeah, you know, there, there are some... Uh, really, you're going to need a, a prescriber that may be able to prescribe other medications as well. So I really would look for a medical doctor that has that background. And, and I found that my the most open and, and knowledgeable are the internist or family medicine practitioner that really have looked at the whole body and understand the entire body. And so I really look for someone with my qualifications that, that has studied medicine but then realized the limitations of that and then learned functional medicine and holistic care. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to tell us how people can contact you, your web address or phone number? Or both? Sure. So um, I have two offices. One is in Romeoville, south of the city of Chicago in Illinois, and one is even further south <clears throat> in Morris, Illinois. Um, they're about a half an hour away from each other. Um, they can call our intake office at 630-226-9303. Um, That's 226-9303. Nine three zero three area code six three zero and right now I do have a wait list. I have a wait list running probably into August at this point, 
Um, but I do have a, I do a cancellation for new patients. It's tough because I like to get patients in um, once and then we get labs, we do whatever we need to do and I, you know, see them or hear from them again in two weeks. But I also have an advanced practice nurse named Roxana. Um, I've been really lucky to have found her and I've been training her in functional medicine. She actually did advanced training in California with the Institute for Functional Medicine. She's highly qualified and um, very, very sympathetic to those of us that have autoimmune disease. She's fantastic. She is accepting patients and I, she extends my care so I see the patient with her. Um, um, I would still oversee that patient's care through Roxana, and she's booking, I think, into May at this point, but you can reach either of us at that number. And then our, our, um, our website is www.ipd.md. That's ipd.md as in medical doctor. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I know that there are going to be people that ask this, so <laughs> I'll ask it for them. Do you just have telephone consultations with people in the US or outside of the US? Um, right for right for right now we've you know we've had some interest from abroad, but we haven't had any takers. <laughs> okay. So sure, I, I would we would take we would take phone calls from abroad. You would. Oh that's fantastic. Yeah. Well <laughs> what an amazing show this has been. We've learned so much about different things, especially about the, the supplements before surgery hadn't ever heard of that before so that was a a good one um we just have time for one more quick question um do we yes just let's have a look uh oh okay um karen says do you do testing for lyme disease and will ldn affect those tests um, if it's truly, yes, I do test for Lyme disease. And I'll, I'll have to say with an asterisk as well that Lyme disease is one of the most difficult diseases to test for. And, in fact, there's no perfect test. Um, as far as the protein tests and the antibody tests, they can all be negative and you can still have Lyme disease. I actually prefer to run um, tests of the immune system to see if one, one certain part of the complement system is elevated and one part of the immune system is depressed, then that can only be Lyme disease. And so... That's where I usually start, along with simple antibody tests, to try and get them covered by insurance in the States. Um, and I haven't found, um, you know, most of my patients are coming in not on LDN, and so I do that testing before. Um, I haven't found that LDN has affected the testing. If, if, if you're really, truly suffering from Lyme disease, from chronic Lyme, that immune system is going to be affected. Mm -hmm. Okay. But... But I also find that I've had patients with Lyme who've had very, very, very significant improvement on LDN. Well, I'm sure Karen will be, be delighted with that. And just very quickly, we can just squeeze this one in, have to keep it short. Uh, a question from Mary Ann, and she says, how would you recommend LDN to help with infertility and how does it work? So it's really exciting. There was actually another doctor, um, Linda. I don't, you can probably refer um, that patient to one of the one of the interviews. There was mm -hmm. um, there was a fertility specialist in Boston, I think, that was talking about this. Mm -hmm. And I've seen similar effects to this. I have several infertile women that are now pregnant um, on LDN and and um, doing very very well. These are older women, you know, 38 and above, who've been told they had slim chances and they. They have autoimmune disease as well, which is a lot of inflammation. So for infertile women, there are several things. Um, for those with Hashimoto's, one reason that you can actually be infertile is that you can make antibodies to progesterone, to progesterone receptors, and you can also make antibodies against ovarian tissue, which is really profoundly um, devastating because doctors, we just now, you know, I can test this with, a very, with very specialized testing. We, we could never do that before. But we now know that that exists, and that's very that can be common with with autoimmune disease. Um, 
And if that happens, a woman may need in vitro fertilization for that to happen. But we do our best to alleviate the autoimmune response and, and change the immune system. And, and we find that LDN really helps the inflammation. And if we can knock down the inflammation, a woman has a much better chance of getting pregnant if they've already done that, you know, if the infertility workup's been done where, you know, there's no issue with um, a man's sperm and a, and a woman's eggs. You know, if they've done that and they say, okay, we don't know why the woman is, why, why she's not conceiving, then LDN is certainly a, a reasonable step if there's any concern for inflammation. And you can run a test called HSCRP, that's highly specific C-reactive protein. And you, that's a simple, simple test that can see if there's chronic inflammation. It doesn't mean that if it's normal that there is none, but if it's high, you definitely have a place to start. And if there is inflammation, you can use low-dose naltrexone, and it can really, really increase the chance. I know that doctor was saying he had a 15 to 30% increase in pregnancies in his infertile patients. And so what I do is I use LDN in addition to optimizing everything else in a woman, you know, to help her cycles and look at her vitamin and nutrient status and really optimize her thyroid, of course. But LDN can really be used as a helpful adjunct in fertility. And, and plus, it's safe during pregnancy. We, we have found, we have found no, no study that has shown that it's harmful. In fact, there are some women that are on um, the full 50 milligrams as an anti-addiction um, anti medication. Um, and they've been pregnant and, and done fine on it. So we feel strongly in the LDN community, um, Mark, if I can speak for Dr. Mark and myself, um, that, that we feel that it's safe to be uh, pregnant on 4.5 milligrams of low-dose naltrexone. Well, we'll have to leave it there, Sarah. It's been absolutely amazing. We'll have to have you back again. Um, people kept the questions coming in, and I've only managed to uh, <laughs> ask you a few of those so thank you very much, and we'll hope to see you again soon. Thank you for having me. The LDN 2017 conference will be held in Portland, Oregon, in the US, 22nd to the 24th of September. If you are unable to attend in person, we'll bring the conference to you regardless where you live. You can participate via our live stream. Check out www.ldn2017.com for early bird discounts. The conference will examine life-changing breakthroughs for treating multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, colitis, autism, irritable bowel syndrome, lupus, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic pain, mental health issues, restless leg syndrome, and many other conditions using low-dose naltrexone. For tickets, live stream, and sponsorship opportunities, go to www.ldn2017.com. This show is sponsored by Mark Drugs, who specialise in the custom compounding of medications, assuring that the client gets the proper prescriptions for their unique needs and conditions. They work with practitioners, integrating knowledge and treatment of experts to create comprehensive health plans. Visit markdrugs.com or call Roselle 630-529-3400 or Deerfield 847-419-9898. To listen to individual radio shows and interviews, go to www.mixcloud.com forward slash LDNRT. I'll repeat that. It's www.mixcloud.com forward slash LDNRT. Any questions or comments you may have, please email me, linda, L-I-N-D-A, at ldnrt.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciated your company. Until next time, stay safe and keep well.